from Berlin, Germany, it's theCUBE. Covering DataWorks Summit Europe 2018. Brought to you by Hortonworks. Well, hello and welcome to theCUBE. I'm James Kobielus. I'm lead analyst at Wikibon for Big Data Analytics. And Wikibon, of course, is the analyst team inside of SiliconANGLE Media, one of our uh, uh, core uh, offerings is theCUBE, and I'm here with Joe Morrissey. Joe is the VP for International at Hortonworks, and Hortonworks is the uh, host of DataWorks Summit. We, are ha we happen to be at DataWorks Summit 2018 in Berlin, Berlin, Germany. Um, and so, Joe, it's great to have you. Great to be We've here. We've had a number of conversations today with Scott Now and others from Hortonworks, and also from your customers and partners. Now, you, you're international, you're VP for International. We've had a partner of yours from, um, from South Africa on theCUBE today. We've had a customer of yours from Uruguay. So there's been a fair amount of uh, international presence. We had Munich Re uh, from Munich, Germany on. So clearly Hortonworks, is, you've been in business as a company for seven years now, I think it is. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you've established quite a presence worldwide. Uh, you know, I'm looking at your financials in terms of <coughs> your customer acquisition. It just keeps going up and up. So you're clearly doing a great job of bringing the business in throughout the world. Now you've told me uh, before we the camera went live that you focus on both Europe and Asia PAC. So I'd like to open it up to you, Joe. Tell us how Hortonworks is doing worldwide and the kinds of opportunities you're, you're selling into. Absolutely, so 2017 was a, a record year for us. Uh, we grew revenues by over 40% globally. Uh, I joined to lead the internationalization of the business and you know, not a lot of people know that Hortonworks is actually one of the fastest growing software companies in history. We were the fastest to get to $100 million, Ooh. also now the fastest to get to $200 million. But the majority of that revenue contribution was coming from the United States. Uh, when I joined it was about 15% of international contribution. By the end of 2017, we'd grown that to 31%. So that's a significant improvement in contribution overall from our international customer base, even though the company was growing globally at a, at a very fast rate. And uh, that's also, not only at fast by any stretch of the imagination in terms of growth, some have said, oh well, maybe Horton works just like Caldera, maybe they're going to plateau off because the bloom is off the rose of Hadoop, but really, Hadoop is just getting going as a market segment or as a, as a platform, but you guys have a diversified well beyond that. So, so give us a sense for going <coughs> forward, what are your customers, what kind of projects are, are you positioning and selling Hortonworks solutions into now? Are they different, is it a different, well you've only been there 18 months, but is it shifting towards more things to do with streaming, NiFi and so forth, is it shifting to more data science related mm. projects? Give yeah, us worldwide. I, that's a great question. I, you know, this company was founded on the premise that data volumes and uh, diversity of data is it con continuing to explode. Okay. And you know, we believed that it was necessary for us to come and bring enterprise grade security and management and governance to the, the core Hadoop platform yeah. to make it really ready for the enterprise. Uh, and that's what the first evolution of our journey was, was really all about. You know, a number of years ago we acquired a company called Onyara, and the logic behind that acquisition was we believe companies now wanted to go out to the point of origin of creation of data mm -hmm. and manage data throughout its entire life cycle and derive you know, pre-event as well as post-event analytical insight into their data. Mm -hmm. So what we've seen is that customers are moving beyond just unifying data in the data lake and deriving post-transaction insight into their data. They're now going all the way out to the edge, right? They're deriving insight from their data in real time you know, uh, all the way from the point of creation and getting pre-transaction insight into data as well. Pre-transaction so pre data, can you define what you mean by pre-transaction data? Well, I, I think if you you look at it, it's really the difference between data in motion and, and data at rest, right? Oh. It's, it's yes. a, a specific example would be if a customer walks into a store and you know, they've, they've interacted in the store, maybe on social before they come in, or you know, in, in some other fashion, 
uh, you know, before they've actually made the purchase. Engagement data, interaction Engagement, exactly. data, yes. Exactly, yes, yes, right. Yes. So, so that's one example. Um, but you know, that also extends out to use cases in IoT as well. So data in motion and, uh, you know, and streaming data, as you mentioned earlier, is, is becoming a very, very significant use case that we're seeing a lot of adoption for. Data science, I, I think com companies are really coming to the realization that that's an essential role in, in, in the organization. If we really believe that data is the most important asset, that it's the, the crucial asset in the new economy, then d data science becomes a, data scientist becomes a really essential essential role for any company. How does how do your Asian customers' requirements differ, or do they differ from your <coughs> European customers? European customers clearly are or they have their backs against the wall. We have five weeks until GDPR goes yeah. into effect. Do many of your Asian customers, I'm sure a fair number sell into Europe, are they uh, putting a full court, as we say in the US, a full court press on, on, uh, on uh, complying with GDPR? Or do they have equivalent privacy mandates in various countries in Asia? Um, or a bit of both. I mean, well, I, I think that the pr one of the primary drivers I see in in Asia is that a lot of companies there don't have the years of legacy architecture that they that European companies need to mm -hmm. contend with, mm -hmm. right? So, in some cases, that means that they can move towards next generation data orientated architectures much quicker than mm -hmm. than European companies have. They don't have layers of legacy tech that they need to to sunset. You know, a great example of that is Reliance. Um, Reliance is you know one of the largest largest company in India. They've got a subsidiary of uh, called uh, Geo, which is the fastest growing telco in in the world. They've implemented our technology to build a next generation OSS system to improve their service delivery Operational on their network. Operational support system. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were able to do that from the ground up because they formed their telco division around you know being a data only company and giving away voice for free. Mm -hmm. right. So they can, in some extent, move quicker and, and, and innovate uh, a little faster in that regards. I do see much more emphasis on, on regulatory compliance in Europe than I see in Asia. Yeah. I do think that GDPR, uh, amongst other regulations, is a, a, a big driver of that. The other factor, though, I think that's influencing that is, is cloud, and cloud strategy in general. What we found is that you know, customers are, are drawn to the cloud for a number of reasons. The, the economics sometimes can be, can be uh, attractive. Uh, the ability to be able to leverage the cloud vendor's skills in terms of implementing complex te technology is attractive. But most importantly, the elasticity and scalability that the cloud provides is hugely important. Now, yeah. the, the key concern for customers as they move to the cloud though, is how do they leverage that as a platform in the context of an overall data strategy, hmm. right? And when you think about what a data strategy is all about, it all comes down to you know, understanding what your data assets are and ensuring that you can leverage them for competitive advantage, but do so in a regulatory compliant manner. Hmm. Uh, whether that's data in motion or data at rest, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud or indeed across multiple clouds. So that's a very much a top of mind concern for European companies. For your customers around the globe, but specifically of course in your area of Europe and Asia, what percentage of your customers are deploying Hortonworks into a purely public cloud environment like um, HD Insight at Microsoft Azure or you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, HDP inside of AWS versus running versus in a public cloud versus in a private on-premises deployment versus in a, in a hybrid public-private multi-cloud. Is it mostly on-prem? Uh, most of our business is still on-prem, yeah. to be very candid. Uh, I think almost all of our customers are looking at migrating some workloads to the cloud. Mm -hmm. um, even those that had intended to have a cloud-first strategy have now realized that not all workloads belong in the cloud. Some are actually more economically uh, viable to be on-prem and some just won't ever be able to move to the cloud because of regulation. Uh, in addition to that, most of our customers are telling us that they actually want cloud optionality. They don't want to be locked into a single vendor. So we very much view the future as hybrid cloud, as multi-cloud, and we hear our customers telling us that, you know, rather than just have a cloud strategy, 
they need a data strategy. They need a strategy to be able to manage data no matter where it lives, on which tier, to ensure that they're regulatory compliant with that data, but then to be able to understand that they can secure, govern, and manage those data assets at any tier. What percentage of your deals involve a partner, like IBM is a major partner. Yep. Uh, do you do a fair amount of co-marketing and joint uh, sales and joint deals with IBM and, 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 and other partners? Or are they mostly Hortonworks led? No, uh, um, partners are absolutely critical to our success in the international sphere. Right. Um, you know, our partner revenue contribution across EMEA in the past year grew, every region grew by over 150% in terms of channel contribution. Uh, our total channel uh, business was 28% of our total, mm. right? So, so that's, that's a very significant that's very contribution. The growth rate is, is very high. IBM are a big part of that. Um, as are many other partners, we've got yes. the, you know, uh, re the very significant reseller channel. Uh, we've got IHV and, and ISV partners that are critical to our set success also. Um, where we're seeing the most impact with, with IBM is where we go to some of these markets where we haven't had a presence previously, yeah. right? And they've got deep and long-standing oh, relationships yeah. and that helps us accelerate time to value with our customers. Yeah, it's been a very good and solid partner, partnership going back several years. Well, Joe, this is great. We have to wrap it up. Our, we're at the end of our time slot. This has been Joe Morrissey, who is the VP for International at Hortonworks. We're on theCUBE here at DataWorks Summit 2018 in Berlin. And I um, want to thank you all for watching this segment and uh, tune in tomorrow. We'll have a full slate of further discussions with uh, Hortonworks and with IBM and others tomorrow on theCUBE. Have a good one.